it's always a delight to uh, be in Massachusetts uh, personally or virtually, and I hope everyone is doing well. Lindsay, you're doing well? Yes, we're doing great. Thank you. And uh, how is the uh, audio? Can you all... Uh, Perfect. Hear me? Wonderful. Yep. Wonderful. Well, uh, Mark Twain said the uh, best place to begin a story uh, is uh, at the beginning, and so... Uh, my, my time is short. Uh, before I melt back into the pages of history, I will uh, just say that I was uh, born on May 29th, 1917, probably not so very far away from where you are now, in Brookline, Massachusetts, at 83 Beale Street. I uh, lived uh, at that address until uh, about the age of 10. And I must say that uh, I, I come from a rather large family. I had eight brothers and sisters, and of course, I was the, uh, I was the second oldest. I had an older brother, Joe Jr., and uh, of course, some of you uh, may have heard about uh, something of a rivalry that uh, we had uh, with each other growing up, and that uh, our father, uh, of course, had groomed uh, Joe uh, to be the one in the family who was to go on and uh, do uh, great things and perhaps one day be president of the United States. Uh, but uh, growing up, when it came to that rivalry, uh, there was such a competition uh, that, uh, and of course, Joe always seemed to win out. And I, I remember quite vividly a number of occasions when we sparred with each other. And of course, he seemed to enjoy it more than I did. And uh, he, uh, you know, I remember in particular one, uh, one time uh, uh, when we had a race, a competition with each other uh, on bicycles and we rode around opposite sides of the block and we raced toward the finish line. And uh, we both decided to cross the finish line at the same place. And neither one of us gave in what can only be described as a game of chicken. And we collided and of course my bike was damaged, I was damaged and uh, my brother Joe seemed to come out of it just fine. Uh, but I uh, went on with that competition as we uh, got older. Uh, undeterred, and I think that uh, growing up with Joe and uh, being part of such a uh, large family, a competitive family, uh, certainly uh, prepared me well for what was to come on later in life. Uh, when you talk about, uh, say, for example, World, World War II, and uh, later uh, as I got involved or became involved in politics. Uh, my, uh, my father, Joseph Kennedy Sr., uh, a businessman, and of course, uh, you probably know that uh, he made quite a bit in the way of money, uh, beginning in his late 20s and uh, to the end of his life. And uh, uh, his primary investment was in, uh, was in us, uh, his children. And uh, of course, growing up in the ha household, whether it was um, Beale Street, whether it was in Riverdale or Bronxville, those are two houses, homes into which we would move after we moved away from Massachusetts. And of course, uh, when it came to uh, our compound on Cape Cod, Iannisport, uh, spending more and more time there over the years. Uh, I, I must say that uh, growing up in, in, in the Kennedy family, was, uh, was an experience that uh, many of my friends and acquaintances, they don't know if they could have done it. Uh, it was uh, rather too competitive for some of them, and we rather enjoyed seeing the effect it had on them when we invited, when I invited friends over and uh, to, you know, to stay uh, uh, at our home. And uh, I, but I, again, to reiterate, it uh, prepared me well for what was to come. Uh, my brother Bobby, always said that, uh, you know, what a great risk a mosquito would take in biting me because it was almost uh, sure to die. I uh, had a number of ailments growing up, a number of uh, illnesses, uh, a number of health challenges, which, uh, you know, again, I think in their own way, they fortified me to become, you know, uh, politically uh, astute, active, and of course, persevering. It uh, was something that I uh, never really talked about as far as all the uh, illnesses that I experienced growing up and uh, a number of times where, you know, when I uh, nearly uh, passed away due to uh, the, some of those, those 
illnesses. And I, as well, I was born with an infirm or a bad back uh, congenitally. I know uh, what uh, was said during the campaigns that I ran from when I went and ran for the House of Representatives, the 11th Congressional District, Massachusetts, all the way up to the presidency and talking about how I, you know, initially injured my back playing football at Harvard JV football. And uh, then of course on the PT 109 in uh, the Pacific in 1943. And of course that exacerbated my already uh, bad back. But the uh, truth was that I was actually born with a, uh, a bad back. So from birth, I was dealing with that challenge. And uh, of course there were more, there was more than one surgery which I experienced in order to try to rectify the problem with my, uh, with my back. And of course, that only made my, my back problems worse. But regardless, as uh, you know, we move on the, you know, moved on my own, down my own personal timeline, I, uh, you know, I, growing up uh, very close to my sister Kathleen Kick. And of course, I never really got to know, uh, at least in my relative youth, uh, Teddy, uh, who was the ninth child. It was, uh, I had to get to know him later. Uh, and uh, eventually he did. And, uh, and uh, so in a, he uh, helped with my uh, vice presidential campaign in 1956, as well as my presidential campaign in 1960. But, uh, you know, it, uh, I, and, and also some individuals uh, during the 1960 campaign, some reporters questioned, uh, had questions about my uh, sister Rosemary and uh, what she had been dealing with and going through. And, and uh, the fact of the matter was that uh, she uh, had born, been born with some mental challenges and uh, the family uh, during my lifetime, we really didn't talk much uh, about what Rosemary was dealing with and uh, initially felt that it was no one else's business, uh, you know, as far as what my sister was, was, was going through. And, and then, of course, my father, uh, without my uh, mother's consent or knowledge, had uh, put her through, had uh, paid for a surgery for Rosemary that only made her mental challenges uh, more challenging and actually uh, set her back. And she never really recovered from that. And, uh, you know, so when it comes to what our family had uh, gone through and was dealing with at various times, in the 1920s and the 1930s and into the 40s, uh, culminating, I think, you know, you, you know, when it comes to the war and, you know, uh, World War II, and uh, some of you uh, might uh, have some memories of that time or your parents uh, uh, lived through that time. And I, um, when it came to World War II, I uh, initially tried to get into the army, but uh, my health, <laughs> health challenges uh, did not uh, permit me, I did not pass the physical test. Then I had tried the Navy and I initially failed the tests for the United States Navy to get in. But uh, I, I, of course, a, a famous father who uh, pulled some strings to uh, get me into the Navy and to get me through the physical. And the fact of the matter was, if the truth be known now and safely be told, I suppose, uh, you know, as many people would say, many historians, I'm sure, since have said that I had no business really being in the United States Navy. Uh, I, was, I was something of a liability due to my uh, health issues, particularly my back and uh, my challenges with respect to uh, being so susceptible to so many illnesses. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the things that uh, was discovered uh, was that I had something called Addison's disease. It, uh, of course, uh, adversely affected my adrenal glands and uh, my immune system. And so that would explain why I went through so much uh, in, the, in the way of illnesses when I was young and even into my uh, 20s and early 30s and uh, why my back uh, had such, uh, there was such a challenge when it came to the healing of my back. And uh, if it had not been for corticosteroid treatments, I would not have lived. Uh, probably to, to run for president of the United States. Uh, that, of course, was a closely kept secret up through uh, the end of my presidency that uh, I was dealing with Addison's and I did receive injections and I also, in, you know, uh, received uh, pills that were uh, placed uh, uh, beneath my skin and would dissolve over time or tablets. 
that would uh, dissolve and give me the medication that I needed, provide me with the medication that I needed in order to live. And so uh, uh, I, uh, but they also posed health challenges of their own. It was a very uh, uh, interesting and difficult time, but I didn't want to put it on anyone else. And I took those health challenges for what they were, and I'd like to think that I overcame them and uh, was able to, uh, you know, do uh, my, you know, do uh, the various jobs that I did and do them in a relatively high fashion. Now, the most questions I uh, have received, you know, over time, you know, about, uh, and I don't talk about them very much or didn't, and that, of course, was my service in World War II after graduating from Harvard and, uh, in 1940 and uh, becoming something of a, uh, uh, a well-known uh, author, uh, Why England Slept. Uh, I uh, uh, did a thesis, did my thesis work, and it received recognition. And with the help of my father, he, uh, he uh, made sure that it was published. And he bought many copies of the book in order to assure that it became a bestseller. And so I examined the reasons why England was so ill-prepared for Hitler uh, and, and the coming of war and uh, what England should have done and what the United States should be doing in order to prepare for the challenge that Hitler posed. And so that brought me some notoriety in 1940-41. And then, of course, my efforts to get into the military, thanks to my father, and uh, my older brother, Joe, with whom I had that competition, uh, ongoing competition, he was already in the military. And uh, of course, uh, 1943, my uh, PT boat was uh, sunk by a Japanese destroyer, the Amagiri. Uh, that was in early August of 1943. And uh, very uh, uh, sad to say that two of my crew members were lost and their bodies were never discovered never found, and it took several days for us to be rescued. And uh, I, I must say that those, uh, the time down in the Solomon Islands, my service in World War II, there was a, uh, a young child who asked me during the campaign of 1960, how did you become a hero? And I, please know, I never regarded myself as, as a hero. Uh, I, I was one who came home and uh, was very fortunate to have come home from the war. Uh, but I said to that child when I was campaigning, I, when I was out on the trail, I said that I couldn't help it. They sank my boat. And there, I, I would like to think that any, uh, anyone who had been in my position, I would have done the same in order to make sure to assure the survival of the crew members. And uh, it was, uh, you know, at quite the time eluding the Japanese. We were, uh, in, you know, the Ferguson Passage in the Solomon Islands. And uh, it was a dark night, August 2nd, 1943. And we were out on patrol and our job was to prevent Japanese, uh, the Japanese from resupplying their soldiers in the Solomons, providing them with food and water and ammunition. That's what they were attempting to do. And uh, four other PT boats and mine, our job was to harass and to prevent, to stop really if we could, the Japanese from the resupply missions. And uh, I must say the PT-109 that night was uh, experiencing some engine problems. Uh, it was uh, after midnight, uh, quite dark, and uh, we had been discussing what to do uh, with respect to getting PT-109 back to base. And uh, as we were discussing what to do and discussing the problems that the engines were experiencing and also the helm, uh, this uh, large ship came looming out of the darkness, and it did prove to be uh, what I mentioned earlier, a Japanese destroyer, the Amagiri, and uh, in all likelihood, it, it had not seen us. A uh, PT boat is not as small as some people might think, even though it was part of what was called or referred to as the Mosquito Fleet out in the, out in the Pacific. Uh, my, my, uh, my boat was 80 feet long, and uh, the deck planking, the wooden deck planking was uh, rather thick. And uh, the guns on board and the torpedo tubes and, and the hull. And, and for a destroyer to run over us would have put the destroyer, the destroyer at risk. And, uh, but nevertheless, the Amagiri ran through us and cut the uh, PT boat in half. 
And all of us men, we went into the water, two to be swept away, never to be found. And uh, I was uh, in the position of one who had to lead the uh, 10 survivors and get myself to uh, safety. And uh, I only thank, thank goodness that we were able to, uh, to, to get to Plum Pudding Island and then to uh, Olasana Island. And then we were uh, fortunate to have the help of two natives in a dugout canoe, who as long we, after convincing them that we weren't Japanese, they agreed to help us and uh, take a message that I carved into the rind of a coconut uh, to a, a local, to uh, my uh, command base, uh, Nauru. And uh, we were sent a uh, rescue, but it uh, was uh, quite a bit of uh, the drama and the shock infested waters. And uh, I tell you, I never wanted to, you know, as far as salt water and coconuts, uh, it was a while before I could uh, stand the sight of coconut. That's all we had. We uh, had very little, uh, 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 you know, uh, luck finding fresh water. And uh, we ended up drinking much in the way of coconut milk and uh, eating coconut. And uh, I, I didn't care if I ever had or see, saw another coconut for the rest of my life. It, uh, but, I, but I did. Later, the uh, message that I carved into the coconut was returned to me, and I had it encased in plastic, and it uh, I had it fashioned into a paperweight, and that was uh, on my desk in the Oval Office from 1961 to 1963. So uh, if you had been a visitor to the Oval Office and uh, seen my desk, you would have seen that message uh, that I uh, carved into the coconut that the natives then took uh, to uh, my commander and uh, retrieve the help that we needed. I uh, received the Navy Marine Corps Medal for the actions of, of August uh, 2nd all the way through August 8th, 1943. And uh, I, I, I readily admit, uh, rather than giving me a medal, they could have given me the boot out of the military. I, uh, this, you know, it was a very difficult time uh, when it came to maneuvering the PT boat and uh, I proved that the dubious distinction of being the only commander to lose a PT boat in that way in World War II, uh, having been run over by a destroyer. And so uh, that distinction, along with uh, some of the other things that happened that night, uh, they were very kind in one sense to uh, pin a medal on me uh, once I uh, returned home. But uh, Rita's Digest, my father had uh, connections in the publishing industry, and uh, so Rita's Digest ran a story about PT-109, and uh, uh, that became you know, something that uh, my father felt could be used in a future political campaign as uh, we veterans, we returned home from the war. But I'm, I must say that uh, through 1943, the remainder of 1943 into 1944, my, uh, my brother Joe, I know that uh, the news of, and I felt badly about this, uh, terribly, that my older brother Joe, I think for the first time, he felt that uh, his younger brother had overshadowed him. And uh, I, I was receiving some, some press and uh, of course, as I said, the Navy Marine Corps Medal. And uh, it might have ultimately led in, in this sense, in the following way, to, to his, his death in, in 1944, uh, my brother Joe volunteered for uh, a very dangerous mission, fly over uh, the uh, west coast of Europe and, uh, in, a, in a plane loaded with tons of explosive, tons of TNT. The uh, Germans were uh, firing uh, V-series rockets at England in particular, and the uh, rocket bases the Germans were using were so uh, reinforced and uh, so encased in steel and cement in order to protect their rockets, their what you might even call silos, uh, that conventional bombing had no effect on those bases. And so there was this idea that uh, you know, fill a, uh, an airplane full of explosives and have a pilot and co-pilot fly it to altitude and uh, then it would, they would bail out and it would become radio controlled and then it would be guided to its target. 
Well, uh, the uh, explosive uh, load uh, became um, un, uh, unstable. And uh, before Lieutenant Bud Willie and uh, my brother could uh, bail out, a uh, large explosion. And uh, my uh, brother and his uh, co-pilot were, uh, were, were never found. It was perhaps, as I discovered later on, as president of the United States, because once uh, one is president, you're privy to all kinds of information that you wouldn't otherwise have. I made inquiry into my older brother Joe's death, and uh, it was described, the circumstances were described as perhaps the largest non-nuclear explosion in world history up to that point in time, uh, when his plane went down over France, over the, over the coast of France, and, uh, or what was left of it. And I found out furthermore that uh, intelligence had been wrong, that there was no V-series rocket base where his plane was headed. And so when it comes to the overall mission, uh, it would have been for naught even had he survived. And, uh, but I, I can tell you this, the effect that, that, that the death of my older brother had on my father there was no communicating with my father. There was no talking to him. He would spend hours, hours per day and into the night just listening to music over and over again uh, in the privacy of his bedroom. He did not, dinner was brought to him. Meals were brought to him. He did not join us at table. And uh, I remember when he emerged that he said that it was quite obvious that Joe was gone and that uh, now it was my turn to step up and to, uh, you know, fulfill, you know, I know he had ambitions for Joe and uh, had Joe lived, I probably would have never become president of the United States of America because it was my older brother who had been groomed for the office from an early age. And, and uh, people asked, what would you have done had Joe lived? And I said that, uh, I might have been a journalist, a uh, teacher of history, a college professor, uh, an author, but uh, not, not politics. That would have been for my older brother, Joe. But uh, as it was, I uh, was uh, the next oldest, next oldest male. And my uh, father said, you know, you're going to have to run. But I also, there was a part of me that was intrigued and wanted it. It wasn't just that I felt my father's eyes on the back of my neck, as I said to a friend, I, I did, but also I was intrigued with the possibilities. And of course, then I ran in the 11th Congressional District, Massachusetts, 1946, and I uh, couldn't have done it without a uh, number of individuals who lived in that district, particularly Dave Powers, a good friend of me, became a dear friend of mine, and was with me all the way up to Dallas in November of 1960. 63. And Dave initially was uh, not uh, supporting me for my run in 1946. Uh, I was considered to be uh, a kind of uh, what you might call a carpetbagger in one sense. Uh, I was accused as being one who had not spent much time in Massachusetts. Most of my time had been spent in Riverdale, New York, Bronxville, and Palm Beach. And that I was finally coming home because I had lived at Beale Street in Brookline up until the age of 10. And then the family moved away and we didn't spend much time back in, in Boston. And so a number of the old Pauls uh, and people in those neighborhoods in the 11th considered me to be an, an outsider and that I didn't, I really didn't have a chance. And one of those who gave me a chance was uh, Dave Powers. He uh, took a great risk in supporting me. Uh, he bailed on the one he had been supporting. Uh, uh, he agreed to accompany me to a Gold Star Mother's dinner a, a, a gathering, and he was giving me one chance to win him over. And I had been losing him throughout the whole speech I made to the Gold Star Mothers. I uh, wasn't very good. I wasn't very polished. Uh, I was a little shy, and uh, I could tell I was losing the crowd as well, and I was about to lose Dave Powers until I said one thing at the end. I finally uh, decided to leave, you know, the uh, prepared remarks behind and some of the things I had memorized. And I uh, said that um, I ultimately knew how each uh, one of the uh, mothers in the room felt because my mother Rose, she was a gold star mother too. And, uh, 
that's when I won over Dave. And uh, thinking about it now, rarely do I show emotion in public, but uh, that's uh, then the uh, mothers came forward and uh, they crowded and they shook my hand and, uh, and gave me hugs. And Dave said, from that moment on, he said, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you all the way, you know, from whatever, you know, from here and wherever my political, uh, wherever the political path would lead me. And so Dave uh, was on board and I won that election. There were uh, at least 11 others involved in that first election. There were three individuals with the same name who were on the ballot, Joe Russo. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> there, there was one on the ballot, one Joe Russo, his campaign slogan became his, it was, uh, it was related to his place on the ballot. He said, vote for the one in the middle. There were, so there were three Joe Russos, and then there were eight others, including myself, running in that first uh, House campaign. And I was able to win the primary, the Democratic primary, which had the 11, and then of course the Republican challenger was, uh, yeah, that uh, was, was Barry. Uh, and so that was the first of three runs for the House of Representatives and winning them all. And then in 1952, I decided to run for the Senate, and I went up against Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr., and uh, he, uh, of course, had been Eisenhower's campaign manager in 52. So he's going to try to run for his Senate seat. He's trying to manage a campaign for Eisenhower. And uh, I remember that campaign. Bobby worked very hard as my campaign manager. And, and uh, crisscrossed the state of Massachusetts. And uh, I, uh, I think we uh, you know, hit every town and city in Massachusetts more than once. We had to have hit each one of those towns and cities more than once, and uh, we were able to defeat a very strong incumbent who had money and who had prestige and who had the reputation, Henry Cabot Lodge, Lodge and so uh, defeated him. And in 1953, I was sworn into the United States Senate. And it was in 1953 as well that I uh, married uh, uh, Jacqueline Lee Bouvier. Uh, many individuals have asked how we met. Uh, we were at a mutual friend's uh, back in 1951, uh, Charles Bartlett, and I was, uh, we were at his home, and I said, uh, I've said to reporters uh, a number of occasions when they asked about the meeting, I leaned over the asparagus and asked her out on a date, and the rest, as they say, is history. And so, uh, uh, Jackie, my, my parents absolutely adored her, and so in September of 1953, uh, in Newport, Rhode Island, we were married, and uh, I must say that uh, Jackie was uh, the greatest, uh, you know, asset in every way, uh, and, and uh, the most devo devoted and loyal uh, wife one could uh, could ever uh, want or wish for. And uh, I I know that uh, I tried her patience on more than one occasion. And of course, uh, situations uh, politically and otherwise that uh, she, uh, she, uh, she persevered. She was able to make it through. And uh, she, uh, she was also uh, inwardly tough in so many respects. And she would have to be to become a member of my family. And uh, she, uh, of course, with uh, the, when you look at the number of languages that she spoke and uh, just so widely read, and uh, just so very intellectual as well as real world. And uh, so I, I couldn't have uh, wished for a, 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 better, uh, a, a better wife. And uh, so from 1953 on up to 1963, when it came to our relationship, I um, must say, as I, as I look back, uh, she was uh, one of the uh, big reasons that I was able to do the things that I did. And I would hope that uh, since uh, 1963 that she has uh, received the recognition uh, beyond what she received in, 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 in my lifetime uh, for what she was able, for her accomplishments in her own right and uh, for what she did uh, as First Lady of the United States and uh, of course, for helping me in so many ways to uh, attain that office. She gave, uh, you know, to attain the presidency. She did so much and she gave up so much and she went through so much. Uh, we lost a child in 19...
56. Uh, Caroline was born in 1957, November of 57. Uh, John Jr. born in 1960. And then, of course, some of you perhaps know uh, that uh, we lost a son in 1963. And uh, through it all, uh, I, I just don't know. Jackie, uh, the internal fortitude and uh, her ability to, to go on was just absolutely uh, extraordinary. Uh, I, uh, as, as, as uh, life progressed through the 1950s, I um, was dealing with so much medically and she was so uh, instrumental in, in helping me through it as was my family and as were my friends. Uh, I had to go through back surgery soon after becoming a United States Senator. Some of you may recall when it comes to your reading of history or experiencing it, Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin uh, and his, uh, you know, uh, search for communists in the Department of State and elsewhere. I, uh, I knew McCarthy well. He uh, had dated one of my sisters. And of course, I caught all kinds of uh, uh, negative uh, attention and backlash. There was a backlash against me for not having voted for McCarthy's censure in the United States Senate. Uh, I could offer the excuse that I was ill, I was hospitalized, I had almost lost my life, my back was giving me problems in 1954, 55, and I could have paired my vote and voted against McCarthy, but McCarthy uh, he is a close friend of the family, and uh, I said, hell, half my voters in Massachusetts regard McCarthy as a hero, uh, particularly particularly when it came to the Irish American community within Massachusetts. So it, he even donated money to my campaign. And so those things made it very difficult to uh, vote against him, vote for his censure. And so uh, later I paid a price for writing a book entitled Profiles and Courage uh, because many people considered me as one who was decidedly lacking in the courage to go after McCarthy. And I said, yes, but I never included a chapter in the book on myself. So, so please, you know, so <laughs> when it comes to tagging me for uh, writing a book with the title Profiles in Courage, no, uh, no chapter in that book about myself. With respect to, uh, you know, uh, life beyond 1955-56, I, uh, I had a good chance at the vice presidency in 1956, and uh, Estes Keith Offer of Tennessee eventually uh, got the nomination to run for vice president with Adlai Stevenson. I uh, came close to becoming the vice presidential candidate, but uh, I, I really wanted to become <laughs> vice president. I uh, ran a hard campaign. That's the only campaign, if you think about it, that I ever really lost. Uh, Adlai Stevenson had uh, decided to, at the Democratic Convention in 1956, he had decided to open up the convention to decide, allow the convention to decide who was to be his running mate. And so there was a scramble for delegates and I came up short and uh, in many respects, I guess in all respects, I'm glad that I did come up short because uh, had I been a part of that ticket, Ike was still, as, as you may recall, a, a strong candidate for the obvious reasons and uh, he uh, won handily. Easily. Even Bobby voted for uh, Eisenhower in 1956. My brother Bobby, he was so upset that Stevenson had not chosen me to be his vice presidential running mate. Bobby decided to vote for Eisenhower in 1956, I think also figuring that Eisenhower was going to win anyway. So it was something of a blessing in disguise to lose the 1956 vice presidential nomination because uh, that ticket got buried and it wouldn't have made me viable for 1960. Then in 1958, I ran for re-election, Massachusetts Senate, and uh, won by a command of over 750,000 votes, which had been the largest margin of victory for any senatorial candidate in Massachusetts up to that point in time. And so that positioned me very well for 1960 and running against Richard Nixon. And uh, of course, uh, you might have heard that uh, Nixon and I had been friends for quite some time uh, prior to 1960, and uh, that much is true. Uh, we were good friends. We would debate on the road even before we were presidential candidates for our respective parties. 
but then we had something of a falling out uh, as as uh, things uh, as things proceeded as uh, the political campaign proceeded into 1960 uh, and uh, never renewed and never were really the friends we had been uh, never were again with respect and in regard to uh, Nixon I, I think that uh, you know people ask me about the closeness of the campaign of 1960 uh, I'm sure you are aware that I uh, barely won the, the election of 1960. Uh, it was so very close, a razor thin margin of victory, 118,574 votes out of 60 million cast. If only one voter per precinct across the country had switched his or her vote to Nixon, the result would have been the other way in Nixon's favor. And uh, I always, after the election, November of 1960 on, most of the time I carried a tiny slip of paper in my pocket to remind myself of the slim, the slender margin of victory over Nixon, 118,574 votes. And uh, I should have taken the advice of, you know, I should have taken my father at his word. You all probably know, if you do shake your head, you know how wealthy my father was. He said, Jack, I'm not gonna pay for a landslide. So I should have taken him at his word when he said that, uh, 118,574 votes, all that separated Nixon and myself, more comfortable in the Electoral College 303 to 219, uh, but I'll take the slim, slim margin of victory. Uh, and uh, I was inaugurated then on January 20th, 1961 as the 35th president of the United States of America. And uh, of course, I, uh, in the inaugural address, which uh, my uh, special counsel, he would become my special counsel, Ted Sorensen, he would uh, help me write. And also uh, Jackie was quite instrumental. Uh, she was uh, the one who helped me write, edit in particular, and offer suggest suggestions. Arguably the most important speech of any president's uh, administration is, is the one with which uh, he begins his administration in setting the tone. If you all recall anything about it, are familiar with it, all, most of it was devoted to foreign policy, the overwhelming majority of it uh, devoted to foreign policy. And of course, the lines that uh, most people remember are uh, you know the famous line, I suppose, uh, this is what uh, the press and, and, and others uh, said struck them the most was the clarion call to service. And so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And so that the most memorable, li memorable line, uh, uh, I suppose of the inaugural, uh, but when you when you examine my inaugural address and those uh, and those things that I wanted to stress, uh, one of the uh, lines that, uh, as I understand it, struck individuals later, as uh, apparently the country became more deeply involved in Vietnam uh, after I went to Dallas in 1963. Uh, when I had said in my inaugural address, as let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe in order to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Many people I understand looked at that as uh, uh, a, a call to get the country involved in things that could lead to disaster, that to support any friend, oppose any foe, uh, and to get involved, to get be, to become overextended in world affairs. Uh, I, I certainly can see how later on, looking back from what I understand has happened since 63, um, could be seen as a recipe for getting the country involved in a quagmire, involved in disaster. And, uh, and I know it happened. Uh, when I came into office in 1961, there were just, uh, there were not even 700 US military advisors in a place called South Vietnam. 
I know that 50% uh, or more of Americans were not able to find South Vietnam on a map of the world, an unmarked map of the world, didn't know where it was, why it might have been so important when it came to that very important struggle for the Cold War. Uh, but uh, in order to prevent the dominoes from falling in Southeast Asia, uh, I, during my tenure in office, increased our troop presence to over 16,800, up from the less than 700 when Eisenhower was president. And so I dramatically increased our presence in South Vietnam in order to help those individuals in South Vietnam, to help them help themselves uh, stave off the communists. Uh, when it comes to Cuba, many of you perhaps remember Fidel Castro and uh, my determination to see uh, Castro removed from power. So there was the Bay of Pigs, the greatest mistake of my, my presidency, and one for which I uh, admitted full responsibility. And of course, ironically, the, my popularity soared and a high 70%, over 75% uh, when it came to, uh, ultimately, uh, I, I understand that my popularity in some polls was at near 80%, uh, even after such a disaster uh, as the Bay of Pigs, ordering Cuban exiles, order giving the go-ahead for Cuban exiles who had been trained by the United States to go and retake their country, and there weren't even 2,000 of them and of course, I called off, you know, what should have been, you know, the uh, uh, one of the lint, one of the keys of the can, one of the keys of the operation, air power. I did uh, give the order to uh, have the aircraft, uh, the pilot stand down, and uh, no air cover was provided to the members of the brigade who were there, who were going to uh, try to wrest the island from Castro, and it was a a, a humiliating defeat. And the United States, of course, suffered, uh, I think, considerably in the short term, our image and any goodwill that I had from January up to April of 1961, I, I regarded it as having vanished, as having gone, even though my personal popularity soared. I, uh, I, I felt that uh, I had uh, miscalculated, I had trusted the, the experts to such a degree that uh, I, I suspended my own judgment, and that's all on me, and it uh, was all on me. And so um, I made some changes during my administration. Bobby became my number one advisor. You know, I had selected Bobby to be Attorney General of the United States, even though he had no previous experience uh, really practicing law or in any. I, I told the reporters that when they asked me about Bobby's lack of experience. I said I didn't see any reason not to give him some experience as attorney general before he went out to practice law privately. Uh, they didn't think, they, they thought that was perhaps a little humorous, but not many people were laughing because Bobby was rather young, but I'll tell you he was integral to, uh, to uh, the remainder of my presidency with respect to giving me the advice I felt I needed and to uh, dealing with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and with the CIA in particular. But uh, what you have to understand and realize is that uh, from 1961 to 1963, the Cold War paradigm, the Cold War struggle, was, was the main focus of attention with Khrushchev of the Soviet Union and also to a uh, lesser but uh, not in considerable degree, uh, Mao in China and uh, concerns about a monolithic communist bloc and, uh, you know, one that was seemingly, and, and perhaps uh, in reality, it was uh, intent on world domination. And so, of course, during my administration, uh, Vietnam and uh, defense buildup, uh, calling for increase in a space race, uh, when it came to our intention to put a man on the moon and return him safely to the Earth, hope that that did eventually happen before the decade of the 1960s was out but all within that Cold War competition and the determination that the United States was not going to fall behind the Soviet Union, that we would retain our position of preeminence in the world, and that the United States, I, you know, many people, you know, began to wonder worldwide, globally, what, uh, what Khrushchev was doing. I said during the campaign of 1960, I wanted people around the world to wonder what the President of the United States was doing, not what Khrushchev was doing, but at the same time, 
trying to pursue a path, even though we're building up our arms. Uh, by 1963, I came to the conclusion that uh, we could not, uh, this that cannot be sustained, and that the uh, possibility of miscalculation, particularly in light of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, we were very close to nuclear war, closer than most people, I think, at the time, or maybe even since, realized. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, the Soviets had gotten nuclear weapons on the island, they had warheads on the island, and that if I had ordered an attack on the missile bases in Cuba in 1962, that there could have easily been a World War III because those weapons were actually near to being fired, having that capability, than we thought at the time. And so Khrushchev and I were able to come to an agreement in late October of 1962 and averted a catastrophe. And I would hope that uh, the world hasn't come any closer to nuclear war uh, when compared to October of 1962, those 13 days. Uh, because quite frankly, uh, that, brink, that kind of brinkmanship, um, playing with the lives of literally billions of people, people, um, that, that uh, cannot uh, be allowed to come to pass, again, in my, in my humble opinion. And so that's why, as well, I was for a nuclear test ban treaty, which we were able to get in 1963. And of course, my speech at American University in 1963, offering the olive branch to Khrushchev, who called that speech, uh, one of the greats, he said, my inaugural address, as well as the American University speech, uh, uh, greatest speeches uh, of any American president since Franklin Roosevelt. So during the Cold War, uh, we're of the Cold War. Uh, you know, we all share, we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. What I said to the graduating class of American University in 1963. I, uh, I know that I've covered quite a bit. I know that my time runs short. And I would hope that your patience is not running short. You have been very kind to listen to me. I hope there are no faint hearts in Massachusetts. You've invited me into your rooms virtually. And uh, for that, I am indebted. I appreciate it so very much. So if there are any uh, questions before I melt back into the pages of history, please feel free to ask, and I will be delighted to take them. Ms. Reardon? I thought it was really interesting that you were so upfront and honest. And I'm someone who still has a Kennedy hat from the very first election. So I am definitely a Kennedy person, but um, it was, I think it was very refreshing that you were, um, you know, I, I'd say you were very pro Kennedy in your presentation, but I also think you were very honest about the fact that no one is perfect. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it was a tough time when, uh, I mean, we all know where we were that day in 1963. Oh, and we can recount that day with, with great detail and the days following it. So, uh, but thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Profoundly appreciate it. Profoundly. I do. Ms. Hoffman, it looks like you have a question. How long did it take him to, to study all this information? So you're asking me as the character interpreter as far as... <laughs> yeah. um, I have uh, my, uh, my mom um, my, and my mother passed away in, in 2007. Um, and I was born several years after President Kennedy's trip to Dallas, after he went to Dallas. I have really, my mom, when she was in high school, she campaigned for him. And um, my grandmother, her mom, was a huge Kennedy fan. And um, my grandmother was at his inaugural parade in 1961. My, my grandmother worked in Washington, D.C. on K Street. And uh, um, I never tired, and, and I majored in history in, in, in college, loved history from an early age. And so it's my mom and grandmother who told me all kinds of stories. And the real first person, my, my, my mother and her best friend, Mary Pat, who attended a Catholic school, 
they got together and they went to see Kennedy when he campaigned in Northern Virginia in 1960. And you would think, you know, and this was a few years before the Beatles, before the British invasion, you would have oh, wow. thought, you know, he was one of the Beatles, before there were the Beatles, uh, before the Beatles, were in, they, they were going wild for him in Alexandria and uh, where they saw him. And I, growing up, asked all kinds of questions. I was taken, um, I remember at age five, I was taken to his gravesite at Arlington National Cemetery. We lived only a few miles from Arlington National Cemetery. I was taken there and the eternal flame and everything was explained to me by, by my, my parents. And um, it, it just, and then the events, you know, when I got a little older, um, you know, the events, Dallas in particular, and what happened to President Kennedy. And I became very much interested in, in him. I portrayed the young Kennedy. I have been portraying him for over 30 years. I portrayed him, I couldn't wait. And so I portrayed the young John F. Kennedy when I was, starting when I was 17 and 18. And I did everything to try to age, and I tried to find special effects people who could age because I couldn't wait to portray him. And so I, um, I did for my high school AP US history class. I was asked to do so, and I did. And then at colleges and universities, um, Democratic Party fundraisers, even Republicans like him. There's a lot to like. I mean, Ronald Reagan, one of his favorite presidents was John F. Kennedy. So um, one of the events I did, did as I built back in 2011, I was up at the Gerald Ford Presidential Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan to portray Kennedy on stage along with three other, you know, three, four other gentlemen portraying presidents. And um, it's just opened up all kinds of doors. The, the uh, you know, I can't tell you how great Dave Powers was to me uh, when I was in college. Um, John Siegenthaler, Adam Nermal, Linsky, people like that, John Jr. Um, I was supposed to meet with him in summer of 1999. Uh, and then I woke up one morning in my apartment and saw the, the terrible news that his plane had gone down. Um, we were going to discuss recreating the Kennedy State Dinner at Mount Vernon, home of George Washington. That was in uh, July, July of the anniversary of that um, first state dinner outside of the White House. July 11th, 1961, Mohammed Ayub Khan of Pakistan. And so we were gonna talk about recreating that dinner and of course, sadly and tragically, um, that conversation never came to be. But Dave Powers um, went to the Kennedy Library at Columbia Point and talked to him, had a great interview with him. He was nothing but great. Um, I, I miss him very much. And all the members of the Kennedy administration, those who work with Bobby, who have given me their time, former Secret Service agents, um, who have given me their time to talk. Uh, about them and, and the, they've been so kind. Um, just one of the things that you might be interested in. Uh, so many when I performed, and this is my first virtual performance, and it is the first performance I've done in over five years of Kennedy. I've been portraying other. Um, it, uh, uh, and I just love portraying it, particularly giving the speeches when I'm actually in front of a crowd and, you know, the staccato finger jet and the. <laughs> I just love it all. Um, but people have been very generous with their gifts as well. Um, Price, I, Secret Service agents who receive gifts from President Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy, and they pass them along to me. And I share them with school groups, Velcro, oh, this, that, you know, you name the group, I will take them out. Everyone has just been so touchingly generous with their time and with the material things that they've given. Um, a glass that President Kennedy gave to someone. It has Air Force One, President of the United States, and his signature stenciled on the back. Someone gave that to me when I was uh, 22 years old. Um, and it had been given to him by President Kennedy. He wrote on Air Force One with President Kennedy. says, I want you, you know, this, I want you to have this glass. This was given to me. Um, pictures of Jacqueline, her first official portrait um, in June of 1961. Um, someone who had been given that portrait uh, by the man who took the picture when he worked for Senator, Senator Everett Dirksen on Capitol Hill, he knew the photographer, the photographer gave him something from the original roll of film. Um, same with pictures of President Kennedy. Um, so I, I'm just all over the place, I know, but it's just so for over 30 years I've been portraying him, it has taken 
when it comes to getting into all the papers of President Kennedy, when it comes to the interviews, when it comes to all the books I could read, um, Ted Sorensen, Arthur Schlesinger, um, Dalek, you name it. Um, those are, in the, you know, Joan and Clay Blair, who did amazing work on the young John F. Kennedy, going back to his birth all the way up to when he uh, ran for the United States Senate. Um, Price, I mean, just huge, and just a very retentive memory. Um, <laughs> just uh, when it comes to the facts and the information, I didn't even scratch the surface today, and I know I was really just kind of moving along, and I have a clock here in the background because I don't want to as I am now, taking up your time, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just been, it's all, it's just been a pleasure. It's just been great culminating all up to today to have the privilege of performing before a group from Massachusetts. It's been a while since I performed in Connecticut and Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Thank you so much. Do you, do you think you have one, time for one more question? Oh, sure. I have time oh, okay. as long as okay. you'll tolerate me. Okay. <laughs> um, so someone asked, did you, um, did you have hope for your children to go into politics? Going back into character now. Yes. I, I, um, I, I was perhaps, there were some thoughts uh, about John Jr. going into politics and, um, and if, if Caroline was so disposed, but there was talk of, uh, of course, Bobby becoming president. Uh, and then after Bobby becoming president, then there was the talk of Teddy uh, going on to become president. But uh, that was in private because I didn't want the charge of too many Kennedys <laughs> and some kind of Kennedy dynasty or the establishment of a modern form of royalty in the country. So most of those conversations were, uh, were kept private about Bobby eventually maybe in uh, 68. And, uh, and after Bobby, Teddy at some point, and then of course you uh, would have John Jr. and Caroline old enough. But I don't know if the country could have uh, <laughs> taken so many Kennedys. But uh, there were those conversations behind the scenes, yes. You all have been so wonderful. And Lindsay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. For this was so up, nice. inviting me. And, uh, and everyone who stayed with me, and uh, listened and took something away from this of value. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and a privilege to perform today. Thank you.